Thank you again to the City of Toronto for presenting this session and the Ways in the sorry the Academy Talks Ways and Means series. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. First, I'd like to welcome Ariana Sadat. Ariana's portfolio includes The Twilight Zone, Star Trek Beyond, and Avatar: The Last Airbender. Currently, she's starting her own company to bring the worlds of production and post a bit closer to her goals. Hi, Ariana. Um, next is Jason Hunter. Jason is the production lead with a focus on virtual cinematography and environments at the Screen Industries Research and Training Center. His extensive experience allows him to provide training and applied research in order to support, support local SMEs in adopting performance capture, virtual reality, 360 video, and virtual production. Welcome, Jason. Next is Muja Liao. Uh, Muja is the head of virtual art department and art director at Pixamondo. For the past decade, Muja has worked on many high profile titles such as The Mandalorian, Westworld, Star Trek Discovery, Wonder Woman, and The Fast and the Furious. Hi, Muja. And finally, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's session, Lisa Sepp Wilson. For nearly 30 years, Lisa has served in roles as vendor and client-side VFX producer, on-set VFX supervisor, VFX unit director, and studio owner, managing director, and head of production in both Vancouver and Toronto. Lisa was recently re-elected to the executive board of the Visual Effects Society LA and also serves on the Toronto section board of managers as its treasurer. Thank you all so much for joining us here today and welcome. Oh, sorry, Lisa, you're you're just on mute. It's auto muted you. Oh, so, okay, yeah. sorry about that. I was just saying thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and welcome to our panel and everyone else who's joined today. Um, we wanna just kick it right off with developing technology. Um, I think it's something that we should start talking about in earnest, uh, especially with new people entering the workforce. Um, I think I'll I'll open the floor to everyone at this point. Um, I know Ariana and Jason have a particular uh, affinity for this topic. So, you know, what exciting trends are we seeing in the industry? Um, what kind of opportunities out there are out there for new people, and how do they, you know, break in? Sorry, this is really happening. Jason or Ariana, <laughs> just go ahead. Sure, I'll start us off. Yeah, I mean, um, the world of virtual production has been so exciting, you know, these past couple of years as, as we've really started to see it coming into the mainstream. And, you know, it's just a brand new set of, of tools and technologies that have sort of been amalgamated from, you know, things that have been quite around for quite some time. But now we're coming together to like make this new and exciting um, tool set for us to use. So, you know, what, what isn't exciting in, in virtual production right now? Uh, we were just discussing before we came on here, like some of the new AI tools, you know, things like Stable Diffusion, Dolly, Night Cafe. Um, these are all like highly accessible uh, tools and a, a brand new way to create new imagery. Um, when it comes to, you know, in-camera visual effects, there's things like frame remapping and multi-camera shoots and high frame rate, like all those things that the next level of in-camera VFX is going to bring uh, to the table. And, and just so many awesome like crew collaboration tools, next gen asset sharing, omniverse libraries that allow you to you, you know, use natural language to search for items. Um, the list kind of goes on. So it's it's, it's all very really exciting. Cool. Yeah. Mucha, do you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I, I totally agree with Jason. Obviously, uh, for my role and my place as the head of virtual art department at Pixel, virtual production is our focus at the moment. So definitely uh, with the real-time technology that's been introduced in the recent years, we see a lot of converging industries in that space. So bringing in VFX, gaming, and utilizing gaming technology, working with uh, interactive experiences, installations, concerts, and even some city planning has all been utilizing the same technology nowadays. Um, and because of that, we're now looking at quicker feedback loop and shorter production periods and smaller teams. We can achieve a lot of things with less people at much shorter time. So it, there's a lot of, um, needs now from what I can see for developers and technical artists uh, to keep up with the rapid uh, development in this technology and also with AI as uh, Jason was pointing out. Um, and I wanted to like hone in not only on like the 
image generation sort of AI, but things that would actually make host VFX a little bit easier. Things like auto rotoscoping and masking, uh, auto coloring and grading, tools like denoising or upscaling that just takes a lot of the mundane kind of boring tasks that we are used to in our industry and making it a little bit more fast paced and quicker so that we can actually focus our energy on the parts that we really care about, like the creatives. Cool. Um, where do you see more opportunity coming down the pike for people graduating these days from schools? Where do you see, you know, where would you t tell someone to focus on at this point? I can give you a list. Uh, so developers and technical artists, for sure, as we've mentioned, they are needed more than ever before to support this rapid developments. Generalists that could fulfill a lot of different roles have been becoming in high demands. Uh, people who are very niche are actually harder to task. Uh, people who are more into procedural and non-destructive workflows uh, focus on modularity, tileable methods, and kit batch sort of approach uh, is becoming more and more popular. So artists who can basically do a little bit of 3D modeling, texturing, shading, uh, the more things they can touch base on, the more valuable they are to us. Um, photogrammetry and reality capture sort of things have become very popular too because the time has been shortened for these productions. So having a giant library of assets that's photorealistic has become one of our main focus so that we can actually uh, build these worlds in time. So that's definitely a space that we need. And then um, I want to say that we're really looking for unicorns right now, because in the ideal world, we want people who come from VFX backgrounds, so they understand the kind of quality and fidelity that we aim for in traditional VFX from TV and film, uh, but also learning these new technology, embracing real time and gaming softwares uh, and those things to be able to work with virtual production. And those are very few right now. So if for new people, they want to get into the industry, I think learning a little bit on both uh, would be really beneficial to them and make them very valuable for us. Cool. You guys have anything you want to add, Jason, Ariana? Uh, yeah, I would just say like one of the best ways to go into this from just jumping off what Muja said is like getting into it, learning on real, especially the technical side. That's a really like big spot that we're looking to fill because there's a lot of creatives out there and there's so many different types, but that technical spot is just like getting into that niche that is heavily needed and then um learning with, people, with that with the creative side would just be that unicorn mm -hmm. in the field to grab so and especially the best thing about unreal is it being free so downloading it and then just being able to do even youtube tutorials are one of the best ways even that i learned mm -hmm. right. uh, youtube tutorials and on set so uh, i would highly recommend grabbing unreal and just throwing yourself into it into the deep end <laughs> Cool. And I know the Unreal Fellowship is something that actually posts all of their lessons online for nothing for free as well. Exactly. So yeah, that's yeah. a really helpful tool out there. Exactly. Yeah, just to build off that, I mean, it's it's really cool to see how we've had like this shift where filmmakers are becoming more software savvy and then more programmers programming are like starting to speak creatively in terms of like shot compositions, framing, lighting conditions. So it's really cool to see people growing in different directions. And, and as we both identified here, it's this, this great merging of, of these industries where we have, you know, people who are usually completely technical savvy and then others who are usually creative now coming together and, <laughs> and big studios looking for those unicorns who have the best yeah. of both worlds. That's not to say it should be intimidating um, that you need to have experience on both of those sides. Um, but yeah, like definitely individuals who have unreal proficiencies, even basic stuff like scene manipulation, uh, importing assets, things like that. And then starting to get deeper into those like in-camera visual effects, templates, switchboard and display, all that other kind of stuff. There's so many learning learning tools out there. Um, it's just a great a great time to be be able to sort of dip into whichever area excites you most. And also building off of that, uh, one thing I've noticed because of this shift, it's actually providing a lot of opportunities for younger people, uh, individuals that actually don't have a lot of years in the industry, but 
by having knowledge in Unreal, in real time technology, they are given the opportunity to work uh, with a lot more experienced individuals and operating even on set at the LED volume, uh, just being involved in production and shoots. That's something that we are never really given before. You know, post will stay in post and production will be production. Now we're seeing all these worlds collide. And for us at Pixel, we're starting to really uh, give advice and have regular calls with filmmakers from directors to production designers, DPs, so that we putting a lot of efforts in planning the environment as opposed to fixing it in post. So all of that, it's almost almost like providing this really exciting new way of working that kind of levels the playing field so that younger individuals who are more tech savvy are being placed into these roles and given more responsibilities that they've never really had the chance before. So it's very exciting time as long as you can get in the upfront of these technology, you become valuable and then you are actually given way more responsibility than, than what we had previously. Right, and I mean, and that goes with my next question uh, about mentorship. I mean, if you're taking someone under your wing and you're bringing them along and you know using their raw talents and knowledge, then you're sort of mentoring them, but also helping them to take a, take control of what they need to do. And so I just wanted to say, you know, what does it mean to be an advocate or an, a mentor to these younger people coming in? It means to support them any way you can. Uh, this is something that I'm deeply passionate about. Also, it is my responsibility as a head of department. And I've been building teams for about eight years since I've stepped into the supervision role. Uh, but really understanding the individual and their true strength and showing them what could be done uh, is what we focus the most on. And then depending on their skill sets and their interests, we look for the tasks that would pair up the most to what they want to achieve in their future and really realize their true potential in that way. Um, and then we will also provide them challenges so that it would uh, give them the push that they need to go to the next level as well. And then we need to empower, obviously, the shy individuals who don't really speak in meetings uh, and making them feel included and just basically hone in on the teamwork and sharing, collaboration, which I think in, in virtual production and the space that we're in now, uh, more so than ever before, everyone is bringing something new to the table. They all come from different backgrounds. In my team right now, we have people who come from comping, compositing backgrounds, some people coming from asset backgrounds, some from concept art, some from sure. map painting. They, it's like yeah. an ecosystem within itself. Yeah. yeah. So supporting those guys is, uh, is what I would say. Cool. And how does CERT deal with um, mentorship or with bringing people along, Jason? Yeah, there's like uh, two things I think are really important um, that we've learned over the past couple of years training a lot of people in this field. Uh, the first thing is getting access to equipment. So there's a lot of moving parts, you know, different flavors and way to mix things up uh, to the point that like, and not everyone can afford all these like little pieces of hardware to test this workflow or that workflow. Uh, I'm not all saying we need access to like giant me mega stages, but you know, the basics, you know, uh, yeah. st it's still a high barrier to entry for some. So, you know, a good gaming workstation, a camera, maybe the ability to feed that video into your computer, uh, a tracking system, maybe to see ICVFX and true action. And kind of once you get these puzzle pieces to come together and give you that like end to end result, now you can sort of break it apart again and scale it according to your needs and like really start to understand why you may or may not need camera tracking for a particular shot and start to understand the graphics load of a particular scene and why there are consumer level GPUs versus industry level GPUs. Right. So like getting that initial access and being led along by a mentor really helps mm -hmm. sort of demystify the technology at work. And it honestly like puts a lot of people at ease of what's actually going on. Um, the second thing I'd mention is sort of like an applied practical hands-on learning experience uh, with something that you're passionate about. So, you know, like we're all filmmakers and exploring a new exciting tool to tell stories with 
there's nothing more gratifying than like opening that door of possibilities to someone and showing, you know, the current boundaries and limitations of those things and letting them run wild with it, right? You know, that's that's what content creation means right now to be in virtual production tools. And the more exposure, the more talent we can mentor to leverage it, uh, that's sort of when the innovation happens. Because once right. people know the limits, now they can sort of say, all right, now I know where we tried this last time, but what if we start to combine this tool with this other one? Like, what do we get now? And now we start to get like even cooler ways of, of using virtual production and these types of techniques. So that's what's so exciting. And that's why I feel it's really important to like train and expose people uh, makers of all forms of media to these types of tools right now. Very cool. Uh, Ariana, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to jump off that just with my own experiences, especially as someone who's been mentored before. Um, one of the biggest impacts I had was the accessibility to the mentor. So um, with my mentor, she was uh, very like, she understood what I was going through. And it's really nice to get that perspective of not only learning the technical boundaries and new ideas, but also the speaking points and like the political boundaries within our industry of like how to go forward and stuff, because I don't think that's taught that much. Uh, no. So I do think that's something that is, yeah, really good to um, learn about from the mentor. In general, mentors are exactly what you, Jason and Muja said. Uh, someone who's there to collaborate, inspire confidence, and just inspire new ways to do things. Um, but I do think accessibility is a really good thing for them to have, as well as giving them both points of like, here's the creative and technical side, as well as here's what this industry actually can be like. And this is what you should uh, essentially not speak, but sort of the political lines you have to watch out for, which is something I think is very useful. Cool. A communication point is really, really good to Ariana about like being available all the time, right? Um, or, or having, finding ways to uh, stay connected with your mentor um, because <laughs> software and everything is changing so fast um, yeah. that, you know, you have to stay on top and, and continuously be addressing challenges in different ways. Um, so yeah, we've, you know, find, finding ways to, to have that open level communication. It's not just like a a pre-production meeting here and there, but like ongoing questions, right? Yeah, because then you feel a genuine sort of connection that someone's actually mentoring you or helping you out in the sense of they're watching for your well-being and want you to grow in the industry, which is it's pretty nice. And I've known other people who've gone through the same thing. It's it's really great. <laughs> Communication's a big part. Have you guys found that it's been more difficult to be men, you know, mentor someone from being remote most of the time? I mean. That was something in the days before COVID, we could actually just walk down the hall and have everyone in the same space, but we don't do that anymore. So do you find that a bit of a challenge? Um, yes and no. Uh, difficult, like what you're saying, that we used to sit beside each other so that we can turn around and quickly glance over at what the other person's doing and say, oh, actually, you know what? I think the client meant like this. So you can do demonstrations in front of them, very quickly and it's like a very spontaneous thing. Now you have to find gaps in between meetings and things to say, oh, can I borrow you for 10 minutes? Let's talk about this. But then also it provides the flexibility at the same time that before you have to be at the studio to do this. But now uh, if they had a quick question at any point, they think about it. If it's like, oh, after seven, that person should have logged off already. They could leave a message and then quickly jump on a call sometimes. Or if there's emergencies before the shoot and then we need to solve something together, we can hop on a call very quickly. Yeah. Doing that with people across different uh, places like Vancouver, Montreal at the same time so we can collaborate a bit more easily. So it's kind of good and bad. Right. <laughs> Yeah, there's certainly pros and cons, and I think you've nailed it there. That it's just about finding the right right tools yeah. that work for your your departments. Um, yeah. You know, just remembering that you're no longer a desk away, but you're a Slack message away, or or whatever it might be, whatever that communication tool that you're using, and and keeping it open, right, and having those understanding boundaries of when people can notify you, when they can yeah. meet with you, because uh, yeah. of course we all know how many notifications can can add up and and <laughs> change Absolutely. the direction of a of a productive day. Um, but certainly, yeah. you know, the, the flexibility is huge and, and yeah. it's really important for the type of industry we're in to be agile like that. Yeah. 
the communication is the key. I mean, it's always the key, but it's even more so more important now, I think. Um, in terms of inclusion, I mean, we talked about in, how, how many different types of artists you have on a team. Mm -hmm. um, what ways do you think video game or gaming and BFX industries are, are evolving to include and create a, uh, a, a sorry, a, an environment of diversity? Um, well, starting with hybrid approach or working from home, we're including people from all over the world to collaborate with each other, first and foremost. That's probably one of the most positive things that came out of COVID. Um, so now we are talking to people really far away from us. Uh, there are studios that are actually putting in quite a lot of efforts in building sort of like a people and engagement department that would uh, focus their energy on how to include and uh, I guess, harness the uh, the power of diversity and then making sure that people are uh, heard. Uh, there's studios that would actually collaborate with uh, certain organizations like the ECC with Spin of VFX, where they've created a program and internship for a group of young black artists. And then later on, a lot of them were kept if that was a right fit. So we see that in VFX, definitely a lot of studios are, are honing in and trying to put emphasis in inclusion and diversity. For sure. Yeah, uh, just to jump off that, I think that there's right now this, um, we're going towards a way of bringing more diversity into film and television. Though I do want to point out the fact that it's on its way, but we're not there yet. I do think we're on the railroad tracks that could still, with new technology that's coming in, which is very exciting, virtual production, AI, even visualization, um, we need to make sure we're not on the same track as previous, well, the way that film was, which is not as inclusive. So with starting all these new technologies, uh, and all these new diverse voices that are coming up, um, uh, it's, it's a good thing within our industry to make sure to listen to those voices and to make sure they're not necessarily just used for promotional materials of those companies. Um, because I do sometimes have heard and seen that happen and it's uh, a little unfortunate within our field, but once it starts to switch, if we can with this new um, technology, it'll be really exciting because the stories will just be really amazing <laughs> and the tech that will come out of that will be fantastic cool yeah i'll give you sort of the uh institution side of that thing of that conversation being from part of sheridan college um you know it's really great to see transformations sort of stemming all the way from the top of the chain um sheridan now has a department the office of inclusivity communities dedicated to this very idea and the vice president, Dr. Jane Nagobia, uh, was awarded this year for leadership in equity, diversity, and inclusion by the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. So this is like an internationally recognized award. Um, and the, the research office within Sheridan, where CERT operates, uh, we're part of the Dimensions Program at NSERC, which is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And this program is really focused on, you know, diving deeper into cultural change within the research ecosystem and identifying and eliminating obstacles. So I know it's a lot of acronyms, you know, coming from the world of <laughs> education and government bodies, you really got to love those TLAs, those three letter acronyms. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, how, how that translates to like on the ground work that we're doing. So, for example, like uh, when Warner Bros. Discovery Access was looking to look for colleges to engage in EDI focus, they turned to Sheridan first because we're a world renowned school of the arts recognized in animation, media creation, film production. And uh, this past summer, we developed and executed a 12 week micro credential program for virtual production with the continuing education, uh, continuing professional studies program at Sheridan. And Warner sponsored tuition fees for five participants um, with our and with our partnership with the City of Toronto and workforce development, the city was able to sponsor an additional 15 participants for full tuition wow. fees. So now we have 20 participants from underrepresented groups getting access to high end equipment, nice. specialized equipment, hands on curriculum with subject matter experts and uh, these emerging virtual production roles, which are all rolled around and stemming from you know, what the industry has identified as workforce gaps. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's just been really great to see big players involved here, you know, our beautiful city kicking in and training the education for people that really matter right now, uh, developing skills equally for those that might be harder for, to, to gain access. And, and like I said, kind of like where it matters, the, the micro credential program was, was developed on key technical roles that Warner Bros, like a big studio has identified having workforce gaps. Um, and we're, we're developing that talent there. So it's, it's really nice to see that coming down. That's and amazing. It's great to know. I, I didn't know that. So there you go. Yeah. Um, I know the Visual Effects Society also has an education committee and they're, you know, dedicated to trying to further spread the word um, about, you know, where the schools are, who's looking for what artists or what opportunities there are, what cities are, are blooming, all of that kind of stuff. And those are those are lots of resources that we never had 20 years ago in this oh, industry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it makes a big difference, especially if you're just you're even starting school and trying to figure out and navigate your way through all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, uh, just I just wanted to bring up that Sam had just said in the chat that Access VFX is a great external organization with a strong emphasis on adding diversity to the industry and provides resources on various paths you can take. So that's something you might want to look at. Everyone might want to look at at some point. I think education and awareness on this topic is is important. While some studios are putting in efforts, I think it's still um, an area that's not explored and we can definitely do better. Just starting sure. by each studio, you know, um, educating and putting emphasis into that structure. I, think I mean, they important. don't even they don't even like my I have a 17 year old who's in a in high school but he's in a film yeah. program and they don't touch on visual effects or virtual production or gaming at all which i find is kind of a crime and i've tried to go in there to say <laughs> hey i'll give a talk about you know anything you want me to so hopefully yeah. in his final year i'll be able to do that but that's something that i just feel like you're missing the boat here every sh every movie every series every everything has visual effects in it yeah. And I mean, visual effects as a whole, like virtual production, AI, visual effects, everything. It's there's, they like to call us post production. We're not. We start at the beginning and we end at the end and we're there longer. Especially than now. Yeah, yeah. We start yeah. from like even the script now we're in the scripts. Exactly. We yeah. have conversation about how to utilize the technology to actually influence the script and how it's being written. So, yeah, yeah super important to, yeah. to have that. Education is always a, a few steps behind, unfortunately. It's kind of like yes. when, when when programming, uh, we, we recognize that programming is everywhere now and they're starting to do, you know, coding without, or what do they call it in school, like screenless coding kind of thing. Yeah. Um, just to get, get people thinking in that sort of step-by-step uh, -step, um, type mindset. And, uh, you know, I think with real-time technologies now becoming more accessible and being able to well, see it in real time is a is a big game changer. So that should yeah. start to trickle yeah. in, and and people recognize that <laughs> visual effects and, and that kind of media is everywhere, right? So uh, yeah, teach it young. Yeah, um, we're kind of I'm bringing we're going to another question that leads right into it. Where can recent graduates and current students find resources to help connect them within the industry, find their next opportunity? Uh, yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, I know within, uh, for me, one of the best ways I would say is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a huge resource, whether it's um, articles or even reaching out to uh, people, whether you look up your favorite movie and you're just like, oh, I can try to reach out to these people and then messaging and then hopefully one of them will get back to you. Um, besides that, I know within Vancouver, we have a bunch of events uh, for post-production. There's VES events. Uh, which happen quite a bit. They can be followed on Instagram. I do in know Toronto as well. In Toronto as well. Yeah, there's Women in Film and Television. I believe that's also Toronto and Vancouver. Yes. Um, in Vancouver, I think there's one called uh, Rain Dance or River Dance. Uh, and I think that one might, the other two require memberships, but these I think ones, Rain Dance is actually from the UK. Oh, okay. They have a uh, something similar to that in Vancouver that happens once a month because there's one December 20th. Um, okay. So uh, these are most of these can be found on LinkedIn or even within the schools. There's networks within schools that are really good. Um, and I would say uh, even within the academy, I was put in or fellowships like we were talking earlier on real fellowships 
for the academy, they have bunches of programs where you can connect. Um, and it just re it just requires reaching out and consistently reaching out, uh, which is could be a lot could seem like a lot, but it's very worth it in the end, because then once you get those contacts, they stay with you forever. It's pretty right. good. Yeah, there's a few more events uh, that we were able to participate in, like the the Taffy with the VFX job fair in Toronto, the yeah. VRTO, which the virtual reality meetup group in Toronto. Uh, RTC is a real time community. Uh, we were actually uh, Pixel was hosting uh, this year's with a lot of speaker presence. Um, so a Besides attending all these events, uh, learning about what's new, you can also make connections. Usually there are industry professionals that would show up to the events. So have a casual conversation, introduce yourself and what you do. And often that's where we learn so many different industries are actually converging through these events and meetups. And then I guess just building your portfolios and uh, presence online through things like art station, showcasing what you you've done participating in challenges that's hosted by many uh, different things and uh, put yourself in social media a bit more often. Join yeah. like Art Station Day, arts versus artists type of hashtags where on that day, people would be, you know, looking through a list of people's posts regarding that topic um, and yours might come up and then often in times we'll see, oh, I've never seen this artist before. And then you make the connection that way. So yeah, there's so many ways to connect nowadays. And networking with your friends from school yes. and networking with your profs and you know, those are really important yeah. things. Yeah. 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 I mean, especially in, in the world of virtual production, it's been so amazing as this tech develops to see how open the community is about, you know, sharing ideas and tools and everything, you know, yeah. largely in the in the film production industry, a lot of that has been kept secret in the past. Um, mm -hmm. But especially with in camera VFX, um, it seems like a, a big shift uh, in yeah. that type of community. You know, there's the virtual production Facebook group or Discord communities where there's just tons of developers sitting there chatting about ideas or or how to get through challenges. Um, you already mentioned the meetups, Muja. Like uh, mm -hmm. here in Toronto, we have the meetup.com. Uh, with the unreal meetups that usually happen monthly they're usually hosted at dark slope um just yes a great spot not just not just for filmmakers but like people who are using unreal engine um, yeah creatives in general just a great spot to to chat about different projects different challenges and how they all kind of work together so uh, those types of networking places and those communities online are have also been accelerated by by covid so um <laughs> easy to have a present presence in there and very nice to be able to chat with different people yeah, uh, great that you mentioned Dark Slope. We were just there um, a while ago to present with the uh, Epic guys on Unreal 5 and the usage and sharing some of the works that we've done there. So yeah, definitely great places to meet. And I think it's just the how fast everything is developing. We almost have like this feeling of FOMO, like I, I'm missing out on all of these. Did I miss the article? Did I miss a tool that was new? So everybody is more open because they feel like not only uh, by connecting with people, you can also gain from the information that they would have available as well. So uh, on LinkedIn, like Ariana was saying, is great. I literally would comment on somebody's post after they've um, shared their work and say, oh, this looks great. And then they're like, oh, glad you loved it. Can we jump on a call? I actually work in this uh, field as well. And then we're like, OK, let's set up a time next week. So it's happening very quickly and uh, spontaneously. So very, very cool time to be involved in this industry. For sure. Yeah, with, uh, with the software updates happening so fast, you almost need a group of five people to be like, OK, you guys yes. focus on this, and I'll focus on this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll keep chatting, because you can't. there's not enough space in your brain for all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> that, that's precisely what we do at Pixel, because we realize that you can't know everything. It's just impossible to keep up. So we would literally have people who are focused more on lighting, who focus more on the modeling and the proceduralism, and somebody on the AI, and then we have a group everyone was just throwing their links oh today i saw this it was really cool so joining those groups and just keeping in the loop i think there's so many ways to obtain information i agree 
I think that was the next question I was going to say was, you know, if you have all of this information and you're sharing it amongst your peers in a particular company, is there any way to bring that to um, Sheridan or Seneca or any of the colleges that, you know, teach visual effects and virtual production, et cetera? Is there something that you guys do? Do you, I know there's an academy, Pixo has the academy, um, but is there anything you want to mention about that? Well, the uh, uh, Virtual Production Academy is in the plans uh, with a focus to give people hands-on experience, not only learning about the, the tool of Unreal, but like actually having them on set to observe and how uh, filmmakers are working. But I think where we are talking about now is that every single individual group is coming up with their own list and they have their own groups. It would be nice to have like even more of a uh, mix up in these kind of information. Maybe that's where metaverse can come into play where all of us are now in the same space. And then there's like a giant town hall of some sort uh, where all this information can be found. Yeah, that would the sharing cool. of information is, is certainly certainly out there. Um, I mean, at Sheridan and CERT, what we're considering with our, our micro-credential in our training is sort of smaller customized um, customized training based on whether it be individuals or companies. Because uh, as we already discussed, there, there's so many different flavors of virtual production and different pipelines right now. And because things are evolving so fast, um, it's it's not, it can't be treated like traditional curriculum where it would take two to three, two years to develop a program and then a year to execute because by the time you execute, you'll already be out of date. Yes. <laughs> um, right. so, so smaller uh, engagement, smaller upskilling and training Training is kind of what we're focusing on, trying to you know target in on a, a particular part of the workflow that, per, that maybe someone wants to address uh, and really just narrowing on, on that to, to create a proof of concept or something uh, that, that proves it works and then they can either integrate it or, or upgrade to the next version as it, it comes out. Um, so I guess just sort of being agile in that way and, and mm. understanding the the tech as a whole so that you can better better pick and choose the parts of it that you want to use. Yeah, that's actually something we've experienced. Uh, all the documentations and videos we've recorded when we started virtual production, by now, most of it is outdated because we're in Unreal 5. We started at Unreal 4.26. And now 5.1 just came out. So another set of new um, tools and uh, changes with the software and the engine has put into place. So learning quick bites of things are becoming more important, which I am glad that on YouTube, you can find many videos that's just a couple of minutes long, focused on one specific area. It's almost like we need people to learn the broad stroke and have an overall understanding of this technology. And then anything you need afterwards, you watch those bite-sized updated videos to learn and then to implement. Um, yeah, and it, it feels like it's becoming more real time as well. The learning and the implementation parts, we would literally grab a video, watch it, copy it, six minutes, you have Niagara particles, and then you just go from there. And we're surprised that it works, but it does. Yeah, so the it's loop really is about becoming like learning, fast. Learning the language, right? Like yeah, yeah. Kind of being able to be fluent in the software, not necessarily memorizing the particular no. procedure to do something because like we have other the people who know how to do that yeah mm -hmm. like as you said Pooja, like you can pull up a video and and figure that out in a couple of minutes it's not yeah. about like knowing exactly click for click how to do yeah. it but if yeah. you're saying like oh I, I generally need this niagara particle to w function this way then you as a, a technician can say like oh that's probably going to be you know this this blueprint of this so if yeah. i mix these together that will, that will come up with it right it's kind of it's the concept. It's, it's the that, concept and just speaking yeah. the language of the software, not necessarily uh, doing it off book or something like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I mean, I think that's part of it with, with everything, even just basic, if you know Nuke, like you're not going to know all the tools and how everything works. You'll have a mentor or other people who are sitting around you or who are working on your team who you can draw from. I think it's, you know, just and not being afraid to just know the basics and sell yourself that way and get in the door and then you'll learn exponentially. Yeah, I think it's really big when you have that sort of vanilla base of that program 
whether it's nuke or unreal and then you just from there once you get especially when you go into a studio that we all have our different ways of the proprietary ways that we'll do things and then the collaboration just becomes even bigger of learning all these very specific things so with what everyone is saying i do have to say yeah, that basic vanilla understanding of the software is really good and i do think um with learning it these certain programs with unreal being free and other ones that we can learn separately whether through the studio or through tutorials online um it's a good way to oops my thought just left sorry about that <laughs> but yeah it's a good way to learn uh and oh yeah go into the groups there's those facebook groups that jason you mentioned earlier for virtual production and discord channels so for at least accessibility of the people who want to students and graduates to go you can join those and get some little tidbits of information while learning the underlying software at its base level mm -hmm. and then just to bring ai back into the picture again we've seen like usage uh, of like just literally typing describing what you want an add-on to do a tool and then AI would actually produce that AI, uh, add on for you for like Blender or something. So in the future, we see that whatever function you actually want, maybe you can just give a text prompt, describe what you need, and then have the AI actually produce that little tool for you. So yeah, I think the more focus would be shifted towards the concept, understanding the concept, the idea behind it, and what you want to achieve, rather than learning the specifics on like how to do it step by step. Yep. That's pretty cool. Um, one thing I wanted to say before we start the Q and A, because I think we're going to start that sometime really soon, right, Katie? Uh, but there's a question here. It says, "What was the name of the online Unreal community?" Jason mentioned. Oh yes, I just see that in the Q and A. So there's the Unreal, or the sorry, the Unreal Engine Virtual Production Facebook group. That one's run by uh, Matt Workman, I believe. Uh, there's a pretty good amount of. Uh, people in there. And then there's also the Unreal Engine uh, Discord communities, which has a lot of developers in there. Okay, cool. And guys, like if you have any questions, please get them in there so that I can read them off. Um, I'm going to start at the top. Uh, as a new artist, what is the best way to approach a large VFX company and stand out in your application? Um, for me, I, I would say to that, uh, at least within your demo reel, have the basics down pat that you know uh, well enough that it's almost just, it's so easy to do. So within visual effects and comp, which my background is in like knowing how to rotoscope, paint, those basic uh, small details do add up in the long run, um, including this does go into keying and all that jazz. But right now, if you have any real time programming languages that you know Python, and uh, there's Unreal, it's a really big leg up in the competition because then as soon as you get in that door, uh, you get a lot of opportunities and experience through the company of how to run that program. Um, but so those small things that the basics and having real time programming and softwares is really good. Muja's advice is going to be to put a unicorn emoji. At the <laughs> it helps. So it shows that they've watched this uh, panel. Um, but yeah, I think oh, in all my years of hiring, uh, the two that stood out the most are the people that actually showed up to my class. Uh, so I saw a girl, she didn't belong to my class. And then she stayed till the end and said, can you take a look at my portfolio? So I think just that old school way of like putting yourself out there is the best way to do it because she didn't have to do that she made an effort and then i remembered her and what she presented was great so we brought her on board right away so yeah i, I think i would do that and then also we're looking to see people's personal projects if you actually show in your portfolio a to z of a full realized short film or even just a couple of scenes of that it shows a level of dedication that you had to put in in order to achieve that and we really appreciate that and especially with vfx productions being a large production and then we can't really tell what you've done and what your involvement is personal work will definitely give us an indication so yeah do more of that if possible and people yeah, post their their personal work on LinkedIn constantly, and some of it is amazing. And you just go, "Yes, but I wish I had a spot for you somewhere." Yes, yeah. 
I mean, that's just my personal observation of late because every time I open stuff, I go, oh my God, this guy's awesome. So, you know, I'll call people and go, you should take a look at this if you need this type of person. So putting yourself out there is definitely the way to go. Yeah, how did you guys start? How, how did you get your first job? Who wants to go anyone, first? Anyone, go. Uh, I worked early on in the performance capture studio at Ubisoft Toronto. Um, so my background's in film and television production. Uh, so I worked there as a reference camera operator. Uh, so I really just kind of reference camera for mocap. Uh, had a little bit of experience with mocap technologies from um, my degree at Sheridan, but not a whole lot, but just through exposure and uh, being in that studio space, watching all the different roles kind of perform their thing. And uh, being a reference camera operator was a nice space because in between takes, you don't have a lot to do. So I was very easy just to jump over the bridge, help them out, jump over with PA work or, or props department. Uh, and then you just get a sense of what all the different different areas of film production are. And I think that's a huge part of it, especially in, you know, uh, early, early talent coming out of of school like you hear about film production and it's like well are you a director are you a producer okay those are the only yeah. roles i know but there's yeah. like a thousand <laughs> yeah. like you know, being in visual effects of course it, it's a very different world where uh we know that there are very specific people for lighting and texturing and modeling and rigging and like all these minor smaller bits of the puzzle that you wouldn't think of um so i guess just having some exposure to that and being able to see how one person can really excel at something that you might originally think is just a very small piece of the puzzle. But then when you look at it in the grand scheme of things like, oh, well, if that wasn't lit well, then this whole thing would be out the window, right? Like, yeah. and uh, so yeah, having that exposure and seeing all the different roles, I think is a really big, big starting point. Yeah. Yep. When I go to the movies with my friends, they look at me and they go, how can that there be that many people working in visual effects? Like, <laughs> no kidding. Don't get me started. I could just yeah. <laughs> fall asleep. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was actually just an uh, uh, opportunity from school. I was from Sheridan, actually. So uh, we would have in, like industry day at the end of the program. And then they would invite industry people to come take a look at our portfolios and things. So. I didn't really have a plan and uh, one of the studios reached out afterwards, hey, you want to work on this commercial? And I got the job that way. Uh, later on, it would be like, oh, a teacher would say, by the way, my friend at Guru was looking for people. And then would you like to take a layout job? I'm like, sure, let's do that. So I think my answer is not really useful in the sense that for me is always focus on what you're doing now and do the best that you can. So the work will speak for itself and then you gain opportunities that way. One of my friends, however, uh, did his homework. So when he got to Toronto, he mapped out all the studios and just looked up any VFX related things and then put their names on a contact sheet with their addresses, phone numbers, websites, and all of that, and send out his portfolio to everybody. It's like a very old school way to do it, but it's right. very thorough and you'll hear back from, from people. Somebody. At yeah. least one person will get back to you for sure. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's proactive. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny because that's <laughs> um, but like my I just started in I when I left school, I went to Vancouver Film School. Um, and I went straight into visual effects. So my first job was a riddle artist. And I remember it was through industry night. I remember thinking, this is amazing because I'm finally working in visual effects. And as soon as I got there, I thought, this is not where I want to. I want to work in visual effects, but I want to work my way up. So after working in Roto for a bit, I started to reach out uh, to people on LinkedIn and or being able to find their contacts through or just contacting the company directly. Um, and then went from Brodo to paint uh, and then to comp or, and then uh, I realized oh there's a way that vision VFX is going which is virtual production and I really want to step my foot in there because it's um, something I really want to know especially with where I want to go in visual effects so I just did exactly the same thing reached out to a bunch of people on LinkedIn and got a few answers back and then I started to work a bit in virtual production and got some some of my feet wet in that and that was really good cool uh, we have time for a little more uh, what's your advice on where to find inter internship opportunities for working with VFX or virtual production 
Yeah, right That's... now I feel like the job market is there. Everyone's looking for people, so uh, <laughs> I would go with um, Muja's friends technique. <laughs> Find all the visual the city. <laughs> yeah, hit for whatever yeah. city you're in, just like hit up all the studios and say, "Hey, this is who I am, and this is what I can do. Do you need this?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, it feels like there's a lot of studios looking for for talent right now. Um, so if it was me, I'd be going that route. And there's job boards. There's like vfxjobs.com and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You can look it up mm -hmm. all out there. But yeah. yeah, just get your face in there. Like get, go to visual effects society functions if you can. Go to as many functions in the city that you're living in as possible. Mm -hmm. Go and reach out. <laughs> That's like really good to do. Sorry? going out and just reaching out whether it's through online especially through what we are going through now and then um going out to the events like y'all saying i'm just echoing it yeah uh the last question is what is your favorite visual effect from a movie either one you've worked on or one that you admire and anybody can go first go ahead <laughs> um oh, oh go ahead Muja. <laughs> Oh, uh, I guess for me, it's still things like Jurassic Park. I still remember the impact when I first watched it as a kid and then also watching it recently, it still holds up. I think practical VFX is something that I really love. And um, just that degree of realism uh, often is pretty challenging to recreate in VFX and things. So yeah, in virtual production, at least we're involved with the production designer and the practical build and then you actually seeing like you know people bringing explosions on on set and fires and things so those are the stuff that's that's cool for me anything grounded in reality and steve spaz williams is a graduate of sheridan so there you go <laughs> yes, he the right. nice nice it's funny you say Jurassic Park. I was also, that was the also the first one at the top of my list, but I was like, oh, yeah. I don't know. It feels like a cop out. Is that like a good, is that the answer it's... they're looking for? <laughs> yeah. You got to um, listen to your heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, just like seeing how far we've come with, with CG animation, that, that's a lot of the, the reason I got into storytelling as well um, in this, in this medium is like, oh man, like you can make this full dinosaurs, muscles and yeah. skin, like all in the computer <laughs> like it's yeah. just like amazing and um yeah so just being just being knowing that those tools are there and that it only takes time and practice to get to that level is uh is really inspiring yeah um uh, mine would be it's a little it's older now but it's tron legacy it's a strange one because when i first saw it, i wasn't in visual effects at all i wasn't necessarily in film and uh, seeing Jeff Bridges younger self alongside his older self was just stunning to me at the time <laughs> um, and then so just how the entire world with Tron Legacy was built and it, with it in a whole 3D sense and then how they also mixed practical elements which were their suits and a bit of the motorcycles they rode um, was something I thought was fascinating and then coming now looking back on it I'm like yeah it's clearly you know, you can see what's going on there, but seeing how far we've gone, even with simple things as de-aging, um, like, and other things which involve, like, my next favorite one would be Ex Machina, and how they did a mix of invisible visual effects with straight in your face visual effects is fantastic to me even now. Um, so, like y'all both said, uh, the steps of seeing what impacted me then is still very strong, but how far it's come is something that sticks and is really cool. I wanted to laugh at something. You said de-aging is simple. Is that true? It no. will be. <laughs> no. for AI to take care of this. For, for AI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good one. Like the, that's a, another great example. Like, um, what is it? The latest season of uh, Mando with uh, Luke Skywalker and they, they do the de-aging on him and then uh, someone used deep fake technology and made it you know, arguably 10 times better. And um, yeah. it's like one person instead of a whole studio. And then he gets yeah. hired, right? So this is like a great, like inspirational thing of like not being yeah. afraid of technology. Yeah, like yeah leveraging exactly. It to, to make our work better kind of yeah. thing. Um, 
yeah and just a, a good example of that person putting this out there like hey look look at my version and then yeah like, yeah you should come work for us <laughs> <laughs> it's all these little ways of making it simpler that is just ends up being something that is so useful nowadays with us taking the advantage that technology and ai gives us which is something that wasn't done before and yeah. like you said, it took so many people and now it still takes in some cases a lot of people but you can get away with yeah. it less. <laughs> yeah well it's just evolving so quickly it's just like you said bujo it's trying to keep it up keep up with everything mm -hmm. you just have to depend on other people to keep up with other things so that you can keep with your path but yeah it's tough Okay, well, I'm out of questions. Is does anybody want to add anything before we go? No, I mean this has been a great talk. Um, and on the note of networking and stuff, I'm not sure if the, our information is provided, but please reach out and stay connected if you do have uh, other questions about this that we didn't answer. And it sound is like uh, networking was the name of the game of this talk. So absolutely, reach out. yeah. <laughs> And keep inspiring yourself. Watch cool movies. If you have anything, try to do some personal projects like Muja was saying, based on any cool inspiration or collab or using AI to help. Um, always making yourself more known out there and knowing more technology. So yeah, in the future, we're going to need AI whisperers, people who can utilize it well. <laughs> and then we'll shift our focus from being just doing the day to day to supervising AI, just keep seeing the results and guiding it to produce the results we want. So exciting times for, for everybody here. Very exciting times. And read the visual effects VFX voice, the VS magazine, because there's always really awesome stuff before and afters and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's the Cinefx of this generation. Cinefx is a defunct magazine that was around for a long time, but has now gone away because we have way cooler stuff and everything's online. So you know, just read and watch video because it's watch. all out there. There's yeah. so much stuff out there. One final thing, YouTube channel, Two Minutes Papers. If you don't subscribe to that, you should because they will basically introduce a lot of the new developments in AI and the latest tools and things. Uh, it's a great channel. You should all follow. Cool. Thank you. All right. I think we're done. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to jump in and give a really huge thank you to Ariana, Jason, Muja, and Lisa for joining us and speaking with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. That was a really interesting conversation. Um, and another thank you to our partners at the City of Toronto as well for presenting this session. If you are posting about this event on social media, don't forget to tag us. We are at the CDN Academy and the City of Toronto is at City of Toronto.